Are they going to let us inside? She inquired, trying to not sound nervous. Not sure, Ricky said, also trying to not sound nervous. Benika got behind a pillar and started digging through her bag. She set out with a smartphone, a USB stick, and grabbed the ammo and started reloading her couple of magazines as fast as she could. Ricky shuffled over and picked up the USB stick and smartphone and looked at them. With one in each hand, he started walking over to the windows, holding the two objects up to wherever he thought a security camera might be looking. He walked from one side of the front office to the other, trying to show the two objects wherever he could. A few moments went by and the doors didn't unlatch. He didn't even want to bother trying them, as they would be solid and he didn't want to startle the inhabitants. He walked from one side of the front office to the other, trying to show the two objects wherever he could. A few moments went by and the doors didn't unlatch. He didn't want to even bother trying them. Oh. Apologies, I just read that. Ricky put the objects in his pocket and looked around at the bodies outside. They were diseased. He imagined if they weren't so dangerous to touch, he might use them somehow as a warning. The people inside must not want them as samples, or they'd already be out here probably against their own better judgment. Scientists were weird like that. Maybe Ricky would keep a single one or two or three. He wasn't sure. He wasn't good at science stuff. With it seeming like nobody was going to let the two in, he decided that the next smartest things to do was to dispose of the bodies. Beninko was busy loading mags and didn't seem to mind Ricky puttering around. He saw in his peripheral she was watching him, but she would turn away if he got too close to obviously notice. He didn't mind, so he decided to work. Chapter 16, Clean Up, Evening. He looked around the parking lot, and there was a shopping cart from some of the other, from some other grocer nearby that the psychos had been using for whatever. Also around the parking lot, he found a shovel one of them had been using as an improvised weapon. Ricky dug through all of his pockets until he found his gloves, put them on, and got to work. The first few bodies fit on the bottom shelf of the cart, which Ricky scooped up with a shovel. He carted them over to the center of the parking lot away from everything and piled them up. Beninkus stretched out on the steps of the massive building of the thick stone walls and watched him work, periodically scanning the forest line for threats. Two bodies at a time, sometimes three, if he could hoist one on the top, Ricky moved the diseased bodies. He set one aside to look different, in case the scientists wanted samples. He tried to get one of each type on issues that he could differentiate. The rest kept going on the pile. None of them were moving. When he got to his in the forest, he kept the heads in the top basket and scooped them up using the shovel. It was a quiet and dry evening. The rain didn't seem to want to get going, which was unusual for this time of year, but not ultra rare. It helped Ricky's cleanup efforts. When he was all done, it could rain to its heart's content, hopefully clean away this horrific scene somewhat. Thinking about the calmness of the parking lot and the cooling of the air, Ricky started to smell the gore and realize how disturbing of a situation it was. There were over 50 bodies piled up in the parking lot with a nest that Ricky had made so the heads wouldn't go rolling off. He imagined how comedic it would be if he was chasing a rolling head around with a shovel and trying to fight back cracking up. He wondered if their insanity was somehow contagious and decided he needed to stop any procrastination so this could get expedited. He felt Beninka getting concerned for him, and so he backed away from the body pile, which was about as high as him and as wide as a car in each direction. Ricky stared at it for a few minutes, trying not to see his methods as a giant failure of society, but as the final task to honor these people's prior humanity, he needed to get this pile on fire somehow, but obviously... They wouldn't spontaneously combust on their own. Ricky thought for a second of what was flammable, then remembered <clears throat> the vehicle was running, presumably on gas. The problem was that Ricky didn't have a way to get the gas out of the tank. Ricky tried to solve the problem, but had no way of siphoning the tank. He could look around for a garden hose, but it would be dangerous for many reasons. He had no way of tipping the car over. Ricky briefly considered putting a rag in it and soaking the rag and lighting the car on fire, but... That sounded really dangerous. He also had no container to hold the gasoline in. Ricky looked down at the bodies and saw the blood was all starting to slowly run down one direction. The direction that gravity was pulling it. The parking lot was slanted very slightly and this gave Ricky an idea. Ricky went to the car and put it back in neutral and pushed it all the way back to the pile of the bodies so that the rear of the car on the gas tank side was the closest to the bodies. He caught a glimpse of Beninka face palming. 
Ricky grinned to himself, being so smart, although he thought to himself he had to be really careful to not spark it when he did this. He knew the gas would be old, so the flashpoint wouldn't be amazing, but it should work. I mean, the vehicle had been able to start, right? Ricky took his pickaxe and set it under the car and carefully wedged it in with the heavy-duty forks on the other side pressed firmly against the concrete, then used leverage. <clears throat> the weight of the car was his own downfall, and the bladed edge carefully and slowly punctured the soft fuel tank. Little bits of metal splintered from the demo axe, but the softer metal of the fuel tank gave way regardless. The gasoline started to flow exactly as planned, but unfortunately it was running right through his shoes and into the pile O bodies. Ricky gritted his teeth and gently unseated his axe, then gingerly walked out of the path of the fuel. It quickly evaporated out of his shoes and poured out. Ricky hoped there would... And Hold on. Continued pouring. And continued pouring out. Ricky hoped there would be enough to complete this task thoroughly. He stood back several more steps, then turned to give a thumbs up to Beninka. She didn't seem to have a response like she was lost in thought. He thought to himself he could strike his axe against the pavement on the other side to hopefully ignite the fuel once it was empty, but no idea if it would actually work. He figured if he kept smacking the pavement enough, it'd eventually spark, but until the tank was empty, he would wait. The clothes of the deceased crazies soaked up quite a bit of the fuel before it started streaming past. Ricky tried to figure out other ways of, to capture the fuel so as much could be allocated to the task as possible. He had no intention of going anywhere near the bodies due to the concealed needles and disease, and went and popped the trunk of the car to see maybe if there was some fabric inside. The trunk opened easily, and Ricky got away from the trail of fuel again. The trunk was full of clothes and tons of different people's checkbooks and credit cards. Ricky thought to himself it was getting very hard to find anything redeemable about these people, but he assured himself they weren't all originally this way. Many of them were as much victims on some level as they were predators, even though they all ultimately did have a choice at some point. Ricky picked up his shovel and carefully shoveled clothes onto the fuel, escaping the other side of the bodies. He didn't dare reach in and grab in case there were any traps. He imagined at some level in this trunk could be an entire stash of more needles. There was no way to know. Ricky kept piling more checkbooks and clothes onto the fuel on the other side until he made a good barrier. Ricky started pulling up into the pile more, and Ricky stepped back again. The sun began to set, and Ricky felt the temperature beginning to drop more. He looked at the fuel, and it stopped pouring out of the tank and seemed to be at a drip. There wouldn't be enough to explode the vehicle anymore, thankfully. To make sure the car wouldn't be damaged in any way by the heat, Ricky pushed the car safely away and put the parking brake on. Ricky turned around from his completed mini task and Benico was standing behind him as silently as a shadow. She took her gloves off and put them in her pocket and looked at him nodding. He took his gloves off and put them in his pocket and looked at her, wondering what the next step of their plan was. She reached up and flinched, subconsciously expecting to get smacked again. Wait, he. Oh wait. Beninka reached up and Ricky flinched. Subconsciously expecting it smacked again, Beninka giggled, took Ricky's hand, and walked him back to the pile of diseased refuse until they were about 20 feet away. Out of her pocket, she withdrew, withdrew a fist of checkbooks from the trunk of the car and a zippy lighter. The lighter was hand-painted white with a black skull on it. Beninka lit a checkbook for each of them and handed one to Ricky. As the sun finished setting, they toasted their checkbooks to each other, then tossed them on the pile, both finding fumes and igniting the pile. Ricky got an idea and pushed the car back so it was close enough to the fire to watch, but far enough so they wouldn't get burned. He set the e-brake, then sat on the hood with his back against the windshield. Beninka smoothly and silently walked over to the car, hopped on, and scooted into his jacket and under his arm. The sweet aroma of licorice gently soothing Ricky as Beninka curled up to him. They watched the corpses burn far into the night and accidentally dozed off in the bonfire in moonlight.